joining us today to explore some of these questions is Professor Brian Cox. Professor Cox is a professor at the University of Manchester whose work in particle physics is world-renowned. Author of numerous scientific and popular works on the subject, he is also the uh, presenter of Wonders of the Solar System and Wonders of the Universe, the latter of which has an, an eponymous book companion co-authored with Andrew Cohen. And Professor Cox, we want to thank you very much for joining us today on the Grox Science Show. Yeah, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, well, certainly our pleasure, and uh, this is really a, a great collection of uh, both books and TV shows that you've produced, uh, exploring sort of the amazing features of our of our universe. The previous series that had aired focused on the solar system, and now you're uh, in the new series uh, exploring the universe. Is more of a challenge to go to the much broader realms of the entire universe. Yeah, I mean, certainly in choosing locations, because when you're making a television show, of course, you've got to stand somewhere and talk about something. And in the solar system show, uh, if we were talking about the, the volcanoes on Jupiter's moon Io, for example, then we could go to a volcano on Earth and use that to, to illustrate what we wanted to say. But with, with the universe, of course, you're talking about black holes, or you're talking about Einstein's theory of gravity, general relativity, or thermodynamics, as we do in one of the programs, then it's a, a much more challenging to decide what you're going to do. You know, what, what, how are you going to illustrate these concepts? Um, so, but I, I think we, uh, we, we came up with some interesting solutions, I think. Yeah, I mean, one um, example that I think um, worked well was um, we wanted to talk about, um, in physics terms, the second law of thermodynamics. So in everybody else's terms, why things tend to disorder, why things tend to fall to bits. Um, that, that's the way the universe behaves. It's a fundamental law of physics. And then um, we found a, an abandoned diamond mining town in Namibia, in, sa in southern Africa, which had been it had been left to the desert winds for 50 years, basically. The diamonds had run out. And so as a backdrop, it's beautiful because it shows you that the, this sense of decay and the sense that if you don't do anything, then things crumble back into dust again. And also we could use the sand to illustrate um, the concept of entropy, which is one of the, these concepts that when I, what you find when you teach undergraduate physicists um, uh, about entropy, then they get confused. So it's a challenge to talk about that. It's essentially just the, the statement that uh, it's statistically more probable to, to end up with a disordered mess than it is to end up with something that's very highly ordered. And uh, we did that with a sand castle and a pile of sand in front of these decaying buildings in Namibia. To illustrate that this is the general progress of the universe is towards greater disorder? Yeah, I mean, the, our current best theory of the uh, fate of the universe is that it's going to expand forever. In, in fact, it's accelerating in its expansion, which is one of the great mysteries in physics at the moment. Um, so that seems to imply that it's just going to carry on expanding. The space between the galaxies will get larger. Eventually, the, no new stars will form. And eventually, in, in a ridiculous amount of time, uh, 10 to the power of 100 years is the best estimate, which is a one with 100 zeros after it. So that's a very long time period. And even the black holes will, we think, evaporate away. And so you're left with a universe which is a sea of radiation at the same temperature, which is quite a miserable thing to say. It's called the heat death of the universe. And that appears to be, uh, at the moment, the, the most likely uh, fate of our universe. A long time in the future, though. Hmm. Wasn't there some debate about whether the uh, universe was so-called open or, or closed? Yeah, um, it's been. I mean, the, the, you know, one of the other options is that there would have been enough matter in the universe to slow down the expansion, and uh, just by the force of gravity, so it, all, all the matter attracts itself together, slows down the, the rate of expansion, and then it recollapses. So you could have imagined a big crunch. But in the last decade or so, I'd say, the, 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 obs the observational data has told us that it is currently accelerating in its expansion. I don't think that, that entirely rules out the fact that something could happen to stop that, but it, the, the most likely by far, given that that's right, is that it will expand forever. It's a bit uh, dour, I guess. <laughs> well, it's, it kind of isn't, because it's a very long time in the future. I mean, if you think the universe is only... Um, what, 13.7 billion years old, so that's a, a one with a nine knots after it. And so to get to, from one with nine knots to one with a hundred is quite a lot. Perhaps we uh, should focus on um, how the universe actually began, uh, created the universe. Yeah, and that's, uh, we don't know is the <laughs> correct answer to that. Um, what we do know very well is how it's evolved from... Um, well, certainly a billionth of a second after it began, because that's the, the regime that we probe at CERN in Geneva, the Large Hadron Collider, so we know that physics very well, and that's what we're working on at the moment. But actually, there are, there are sensible theories that make some 
predictions that can be tested. That we, we should go back to events that happened uh, 10 to the minus 36 seconds after the universe began. So that's a, that's a million, 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 millionths of a second after the universe began, um, when we think it went through this very rapid phase of expansion called inflation. And that that leaves imprint on the light from the early universe that we can detect and, uh, that, so, and those models fit the, the observational data at the moment so I, I find it remarkable actually that we can we can speak of those early times when it was an unimaginably violent place to be you know, far hotter than the than the center of a star and the whole universe and, and to, to be able to understand the physics there I think it's one of the great triumphs of uh, 20th century physics but when you ask how did it begin don't know <laughs> So where did it all come from? Is still something a bit of a mystery. Yeah, I mean, um, it, it's, it's one of the great mysteries. It, um, th- there are theories that uh, the universe could have been around forever, and, and what we see as the Big Bang was a, a, an event that happened um, to our piece of space-time, essentially. So they're, they're very speculative theories with, which require extra dimensions of space. Um, but they're all trying to... There's a great, huge question, which is... We know that the universe began in a very ordered state, which goes back to what we were talking about earlier with this entropy and thermodynamics. So it began very ordered, and it's getting more disordered all the time. And you need an explanation for that. You can't just say, well, it must have just randomly got into a very ordered state. So that mm-hmm. doesn't work at all. So, so it's how did it get into a very ordered state at the start mm-hmm. so that it can go on this long, you know, the road from order to disorder, of which we're a temporary structure, by the way. I mean, we make this point in the film. You, you could say, well, it's a bit depressing. Why, why would you have to make a universe that has to fall to bits? But actually, the temporary structures on the way from order to disorder are things like stars and planets and galaxies and people. So it's a good thing that it does that, but we don't know how it got into that state in the first place. Hmm. Yeah, and considering that that's presumably a very high energy state, where did this all come from, this energy? Well, there is that, yeah. <laughs> and also, but that's actually less of a problem to, to many people than a, the, the order is the problem. Hmm. It's, it's such an unlikely state. The, 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 the original state of the universe, that it needs an explanation. So the book goes into quite a bit of how we know all this, uh, in particular studying astronomy and, and light. How is it really that uh, we're able to draw this picture of, of the early universe? Well, as you said, that light is the only thing we have. We, we've not ventured beyond our solar system yet, so all we've got is the light from from stars, planets, uh, galaxies, and, and indeed the light from the, the moment that the universe became transparent which is about 400,000 years after the Big Bang. So we can collect that light and see what was going on at that point, literally see it. And so it is in the, the, the messages, as it were, from the early universe are carried in, in, the, in the light, and we detect it and we can analyze it. And it's, it's remarkable. It's called the cosmic microwave background, the earliest light, which is a, a very famous picture uh, was taken of it by the WMAP satellite. And it's provided an incredible amount of data. It's, it's, it's quite remarkable, actually. But one of the things is that this light has traveled across the entire history of the universe, pretty much, to get to us. So what, whatever happened to space and time, the way that it's stretched, and the way that it's expanded, is also encoded into that light. So you're not only seeing the universe as it was 400,000 years after the Big Bang, you're seeing the, 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 it's kind of a 3D picture, in a way. You're seeing the, how the light traveled across the universe to reach us. So uh, the real precision measurements now of the age of the universe um, come from that data. Uh, how far away are, are we able to see? I mean, how much of the, how much actually of the uh, the universe have we seen? Look. That's a really good question. That because mm-hmm. the, 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 the observable universe, mm-hmm. that's the universe, uh, a bubble around as a sphere, if you like, surrounding the Earth, uh, uh, and it's the sphere that light has been able to travel across since the universe began. So you might say, well, the universe is 13.7 billion years old, so we can see 13.7 billion light years away. That's actually not right, because the universe has been stretching uh, during the time that that light's been traveling to us. So actually the current figure is something like a diameter of something like 90 billion light years. Mm-hmm. the observable universe and that's like if you said uh, w- the things that emitted the most ancient light where are they now how far away are they from us now then you get that figure which is about 90 billion light years across but it's quite a confusing figure actually 
How did all this matter then coalesce from the initial state of, of very being ordered to becoming galaxies and the universe as we know it? That's, that, that's interesting. I mean, that's a really active area of research, and we do. It's not one of those areas that I just have to say, oh, I don't know. Um, we, we've got <laughs> some reasonably good theories. Um, it's thought that, um, that the current kind of standard model, I suppose, is that you had little, when the universe was very, very small, um, you had little, you always have fluctuations, called quantum fluctuations, in very small subatomic scale systems. And then the universe went through in a period of rapid expansion called inflation, magnified those little fluctuations um, into, into sort of areas that were slightly denser than other areas. Um, and it's thought that they seeded the, the galaxies or the clusters of the galaxies. And you can see those in this microwave background light. You can see the, the, that light came uh, before there were any stars or galaxies. It was when the universe was a very hot, dense plasma that that light um, was released and we capture that today. And you can see little fluctuations in it. And, and the, the magnitude of those, the, the, the temperature differences as it were in that light, um, tell you a lot about the early structure of the universe. So we, there are lots of issues with it. We, we think that there must have been some stuff, or that there is stuff now called dark matter around, which is um, a matter that is not in the form that we're familiar with. So it's some other, probably some other kind of subatomic particle that we've never discovered, or we haven't discovered yet. And um, it's thought that that's necessary to allow the galaxies to form. So there's quite a lot of speculative physics in there, or exciting physics in there. But we have a rough, that rough story um, seems to be what most people accept at the moment. Mm. Uh, the book goes into great detail in, in terms of talking about gravity as really kind of being the big organizing force of, of the universe and um, really the yeah. thing that shapes the universe. Yeah, but also the weakest force, mm. which is another great mystery. It's, it's, it's something like a million, 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 million <laughs> big numbers times weaker than the other three forces of nature. So um, that, that demands an explanation. It, it could be that's just the way it is. But it's, it, you can tell gravity is weak, by the way. If you're sat at a table now with a cup of coffee or something, you can pick it up and, and you can pick it up. Even though the planet, planet Earth, is trying to pull it back down and stop you doing that. So it's an incredibly weak force. Um, but as you say, because it's the, the, the only force that acts over long distances and always adds up, so um, it's, it's always an attractive force, then it dominates the universe on the, on the large scale. So um, it is the force that clusters the subatomic particles initially hit together, brings them together into gas clouds, and then collapses those into stars and planets. How close are we really to understanding uh, gravity on, on sort of the subatomic level? Well, um, our best, we, we have a great understanding of gravity. Our best understanding of gravity is Einstein's general theory of relativity, which was written down in 1915. Um, it's, it's a remarkable achievement. It survived every experimental test that we've been able to throw at it. There's a there's a, there's a stellar system called the, the, the double pulsar system, which is two neutron stars. So this is two stars uh, co collapse to as massive as the sun collapse into something the size of a city. Both of them are spinning rapidly on their axis, hundreds of times a second. They're orbiting around each other very fast. So it's the most violent system you can imagine. And Einstein's theory predicts how the, the, the spin rate of those stars changes. They're little clocks, if you think you can think like that. They're orbiting around each other very fast. And because space and time is so curved, in Einstein's theory, by these massive, dense objects, uh, time passes at different rates, the clocks speed up and slow down. And Einstein's theory was able to predict that um, and get it right to, to the incredibly high precision. So the, I suppose the problem is we, we strongly suspect that we need a better theory of gravity because it doesn't, it, it's a different framework, it's not a quantum theory all the other theories that we have of nature are quantum theories at the fundamental level Einstein's theory isn't so we, we're sure that there should be something better but we have no experimental evidence, we have no signpost we have no understanding of really how to do it so, so theoretically we do, uh, string theory is an attempt to do that um, and there are other theories that attempt to do it. But as yet, not, because, for one reason, because Einstein's theory has not done, predicted anything other than correct answers, it's very difficult to know what to do. I, I gather that part of the problem is trying to meld uh, Einstein's theory, which operates on very large scales, uh, with the quantum theory, which is very small scale. Uh, I mean, basically, a, a quantum theory of gravity, you might say, well, um, is that it would require 
or some of the theories say, well, is there a smallest piece of space and time? Right, is space and time quantized? Mm. It, it, it chops up into little bits. And um, th there's some evidence, maybe it is, that there's, there's some uh, th the physics of black holes, some calculations to do with black holes that do this and, and relate the amount of information you can store in black holes to, to things like the surface area and the temperature. So, so th there's kind of theoretical movement there. Um, but the problem, as I say, from an experimental perspective, is that none of these theories have predicted anything that can be tested. And the theory that we have uh, has had every prediction validated to the, the end decimal place. So it's difficult to make progress without some observation that contradicts Einstein and shows you where to go. Hmm. So the interesting question then, uh, getting back to how the universe will end, given that there's all this gravity pulling the universe together, what's pushing it apart? Uh, good question. Uh, the answer is dark energy, mm. and that's where our knowledge of it stops. <laughs> so <laughs> okay. I've given you all the information that I've got on that. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's very strange. It's, um, it's uh, something like 70% of the energy in the universe, mm. it, we think, is, is, seems to be taken up in doing this, in driving everything apart, or stretching space-time very rapidly. Well, not very rapidly, actually. It's actually a very small effect, but over the mm. big distances it adds up. Professor Deutsch is a professor of physics at Oxford University and a fellow of the Royal Society, author of numerous scientific and popular works, including The Fabric of Reality, his latest work, The Beginning of Infinity, Explanations That Transform the World, explores this topic for a general audience. And Professor Deutsch, we we're very pleased to have you today on the Grok Science Show. Well, thank you for having me. Well, this is really a pleasure since this is, like your previous book, a fascinating read, The Beginning of Infinity, uh, which you talk about explanations as really being kind of the driver for human existence. I'm curious if, tell us, how do explanations come about and how do we decide among explanations that are good versus those that don't fit reality? The uh, idea of an explanation being good is my solution to a, a the, what you might call the centuries-old problem of how come things work, how come science works, and all previous methods of trying to understand things like, you know, what makes the stars shine and so on, just didn't work. They just didn't make any headway at all. And the standard answer for that in the case of science has been that we have testable theories now, and, and previously theories were untestable, so you couldn't ever tell the difference between rival theories, and so you could never make progress. But I think for various reasons that's inadequate because, for example, many myths are also testable, but they're still not capable of making progress. And my idea is that a good explanation is one that accounts for something in reality, purports to account for something in, in reality, where it is hard to vary. That's the key thing. In other words, a slightly different account would not account for that thing as well. And so that's a good explanation. The nice thing about the idea of a good explanation is that within science it explains why testability is the criterion for good science. But good explanation applies beyond science as well. It, uh, it applies in philosophy and politics and morality and aesthetics and everything. And I try to cover all those things in the book. So where is testability the criteria for deciding among explanations? What about in those fields where testability is not possible? Well, their testability is just a special case of hard to vary. So, for example, if you, if you had an idea that no one's allowed to steal except you, and that's the moral thing, then the thing is that theory is easy to vary because as a moral explanation, it's just as good as no one's allowed to steal except me, or no one's allowed to steal except you and me, and so on. And so countless variations of that idea, we're all with different exceptions, and none of those exceptions have a better moral explanation than any of the others. Whereas the idea that no one should steal doesn't make an exception, doesn't have to explain the exception, and that therefore it's a better moral explanation. How about the idea that everyone should steal? Yes, so the, w one of the nice things about this critical world view, which, by the way, isn't mine, it's due to the philosopher Karl Popper originally, uh, I just applied it to this idea of good explanations, is that no criterion of criticism is excluded a priori. So you can exclude something, but all of them have to contribute to this good explanation 
feature. So the idea of that everyone should steal also has this property that it's hard to vary, but it doesn't account for the thing it's supposed to account for because if everyone could steal, that would have obvious practical disadvantages like running out of things to steal. Sure, everyone just uh, shifts things around ad infinitum. But <laughs> Yes, this too is discussed in the book, by the way, in, in, a, in a little cameo appearance by Gennari Socrates who suggests this very idea. So regarding how explanations come about, you argue that the notion that ideas coming through experience and rather than from evidence to theory. Uh, yes, I argue that that is wrong and that really what happens is that the validation via being a good explanation comes first and only in the rare and fortunate case where we have more than one good explanation do we then apply, well in, in the case of science, do we then apply experimental testing. So the overwhelming majority of theories, even testable theories that you could think of, are never tested because they are bad explanations. And the example I gave in my first book was, what about the theory that eating a kilogram of grass will cure the common cold? Well, the thing is, that's a perfectly testable theory, but no one will ever test it because it is a bad explanation. There's nothing that goes with it that would distinguish between that and the theory that 1.1 kilograms of grass will cure the common cold, or 0.9, or whatever. And therefore, you could never know when you had tested it. In general, by the way, it's impossible to test any theory that doesn't come with an explanation. And one of the things I criticize in the book is theories in the less hard sciences, shall we say, in sciences like psychology and so on, where one just makes a hypothesis about how humans are without an underlying explanation for why they are like that. And those theories, I think, can't truly be tested, even though in their form they may resemble testable theories. So given that some theories are untested, is it possible that there is a limit to what we can know? I, I argue that there isn't, or rather... There are limits imposed by things like mathematics and the laws of physics themselves. So it's possible that we shall never be able to know, in the case of physics, we shall never be able to know what Julius Caesar ate for his last meal before he was assassinated. But what we shall always be able to do is solve problems. So the issue of what Julius Caesar ate for his last meal will never be something that keeps anyone awake at night. Conversely, any of the things that are capable of keeping a person awake at night, worrying about them, are soluble. And they are soluble by creating knowledge, and knowledge is created by trying to create better explanations by criticizing and varying existing explanations. So these explanations allow us then to transform the world, and that's really what gives humans power over reality in a sense. Yes, there's a, a deep connection built into nature. And in the book, I try to argue why this must be so. A connection between understanding the world and controlling it. On the face of it, those are two very different things. You know, you, you may understand why an asteroid is heading towards the Earth and going to obliterate us. You may, you may be able to work it out down to the last decimal place. But that in itself doesn't enable you to prevent it. But this deep connection says that with enough knowledge, understanding always is connected with the corresponding control. And that's why science is linked with technology. And that's why the unlimited nature of science, which to deny that is essentially to believe in the supernatural, that the unlimited scope of science leads to an unlimited scope of technology, which means that things which are problematic to us are always sol going to be soluble with sufficient technological knowledge, such as disease and death and the ability to travel in space and so on. Oftentimes it seems that technology precedes the scientific explanation, such that something is engineered and then the reason why it works is discovered later. This used to be much more true than it is today, and it is becoming ever less true that, that as, as both science and technology become more sophisticated, it's becoming more and more a case of working out why something must work and then building it. A very good example of this is in the science of medicine, where, let's say, 100 years ago, the mode of action of medicines 
was basically unknown. And we, we were lucky if we were right about the idea that a particular medicine does work, but we certainly didn't know much about how it works. Now, today, it's increasingly becoming the other way around. That is, there's a whole science developing of a designer pharmacology where we under, first understand the mechanism of a disease, then we conjecture what kind of chemical would interrupt the progress of that disease. Then we design a chemical, and only then do we ever try it. In other words, after we have the explanation. And the more sophisticated science and technology get, the more it is the case that these rules of thumb type knowledge, which are really uncreatively generated, are being superseded by creatively generated good explanations. It's sort of difficult then to see how the general model then fits into the humanities and economics. Yes, economics is a difficult case because it is sort of half science and half philosophy. And in science, we must have testable theories. And in philosophy, it's a terrible mistake to require testable theories. And so uh, economics has sort of got itself into a tangle by confusing the two. But a more extreme case that, that I... And, and so I don't actually discuss economics in the book, though I do discuss political philosophy. But there is the matter of aesthetics, where almost everybody would say that what is beautiful or ugly is just a matter of personal taste. And calling it a matter of taste, it has been taken to be synonymous with saying that there is no objective truth of the matter. But I have an argument in the book that there must be an objective truth of the matter, and the argument is drawn from the co-evolution of flowers and insects. Basically, the notion of beauty on which, or attractiveness, on which flowers and insects have co-evolved and converged, we can understand from the theory of evolution why they have evolved the flowers to generate a particular pattern